Welcome to Information Service Engineering. This is lecture number four, Natural Language Processing part three. This is the second part now of our language models and n-grams. So what did we do in the last section of the lecture? In the last section of the lecture, we came up in the end with the probability of a sentence, which equals the probability of a sequence of words, which equals thanks to the Bayes theorem and the chain rule that um, the probability of a sequence of words equals the probability of the occurrence of the first word of the sentence times the probability of the occurrence of the second word of the sentence under the assumption that the first word has already occurred. So this is already the conditional probability times the probability of the occurrence of the third word under the assumption that the first two words have already occurred and so on until you come to the last word. So this is then the probability of the word number n under the assumption that all of the words word one until word n minus one have already occurred. So this is the conditional probability by which you calculate the probability of a sentence. Okay, by that, we could then simply say that the probability of to be or not equals the probability of the occurrence of the word to times the, uh, the probability of the occurrence of the word be under the assumption that the word to has occurred and so on and so on. So let's start over by that. The question by which we left the last part of this, the lecture was simply, yeah, but how do we determine the probability of the occurrence of these words? So where does the probability come from? And you will see, we will do this simply by empirical evidence with so-called corpora. So to understand and to model how language really works, we need some empirical evidence of language. And of course, if we have them some examples, or let's say a huge set of examples, probabilities could be modeled by simply counting things. This is like also you model probability, let's say for a dice. You do the experiments and simply count how many times occurs the one, the two, the three, the four, until you come to number six. And the same works then also here, count the occurrence of words in large collections of text. And these large collections of text are usually referred to as corpus or corpora. What's a corpus? A corpus is a computer readable collection of text or speech and ideally naturally occurring corpora surface realistic examples of a language. One example is, for example, the corpus of contemporary American English. This contains 420 million words of US English, which have been collected between 1990 and 2015. So you find links to all these corpora here on the right lower corner. Or there is a British national corpus containing 100 million words collected between 1991 and 1994, or there is also an international corpus of English, which then also uh, contains samples of, you know, one million words each for, uh, of example, of, of uh, Indian English or also of uh, uh, South African English and so on. So this is the international corpus of English. And all of them are, of course, a little bit different and can be used for language modeling. However, the largest corpus of all that you might use is the Google Ngram corpus. And the Google Ngram corpus consists of engrams of printed resources printed in the time between 1500 and 2008. And they are in many languages. They are in English, Chinese, French, German, Hebrew, Italian, Russian, and even Spanish. And overall, it consists of more than a thousand billion words. So this is really huge. You can work with the engrams of the Google Corpora, for example, here with this uh, engram viewer. Simply use the link here in the slides. And what you can do there is, for example, you can make easy statistics or simple statistics simply to look, you know, how combination of words or single words occurred in this corpus over time. And you can see that, for example, you know, you can connect them, for example, the occurrence of peaks, for example, of these kind of words then with uh, events that occurred then in the year of the publication. So simply play around with it. So this is really interesting to see, for example. Okay, this is only an example of corpus and corpora, and we will make use of corpus also then in our notebook example. You will see this later on. 
Okay, let's have a look again out of our statistical language modeling that we want to do. So, however, the complexity of what we are looking here is rather huge. So, if we have a vocabulary and we have, let's say, a maximum mean sentence length, which is a specific number of words, let's call it n, the complexity we are dealing here with of occurring events is, of course, of the size of the vocabulary to the power of n, which is the length of the sentences we are, we are looking with. So if we consider now English in Webster's third edition new international dictionary, we will find 475,000 main headwords. And we will also find that the average English sentence length is 14.3 words. Then a rough estimate means that we are dealing with a complexity of words that are or would take the space of 3.38 times 10 to the power of 66 terabytes of data. Of course, this is way too large. So we have to somehow deal with a smaller n. And here is where n-grams came into play. So by applying an n-gram model, we make the model much more compact we are dealing with because we only take, again, our vocabulary size, 475,000 uh, words, and take it to the power of n. Considering the n-gram we are using too, we are using unigrams, bigrams, trigrams, and so on. So this then makes the language model much more compact. So the intuition of the Engram model is that instead of computing the probability of a word given its entire history, we simply can approximate the history by just a few last words that we consider. So for example, for the bigram model, so this means two grams, we approximate the probability of a word given all its previous words only by using the conditional probability of its single preceding word. This is the so-called Markov assumption. So we are really approximating then the probability that a specific word occurs, taking into account its entire history in the sentence by only considering the preceding, so the last word that has occurred. So this is the so-called Markov assumption, which greatly simplifies the computation of exactly these kind of probabilities. And it approximates quite well, as we will see um, here, a language model. And if we are dealing with unigrams, we only consider, of course, let's say the occurrence of a single word with respect to all of the words in the corpus. So this is then the unigram probabilities that we consider here. By considering bigram probabilities for the sentences, we only look at the last occurring sentence, uh, a word. So we are looking at bigrams. For trigrams, we take into account at least two preceding words. For n-grams, then we take into account one to n minus one preceding words. So this is how it works in the end. Again, we haven't dealt with exactly the issue how we compute now exactly this probability. And there comes handy the so-called maximum likelihood estimation. So how to estimate n-gram probabilities? We do this with a maximum likelihood estimation method. And this is a method of estimating the uh, parameters of a statistical model given some observations. And by finding the parameter values that maximize the likelihood of making exactly these observations given the parameters. So this is the maximum likelihood models. And for n-gram model, this is computed by normalizing the counts from a corpus, which means, for example, for bigrams, what we have to do, if we want to have or compute the probability of the occurrence of a specific word under the assumption that a specific other word has occurred before, this is the number of the according bigrams of these two words, consisting of these two words that we find, divided by the number of or the sum of all of the bigrams that start with the first word of this bigram with any other word, which means this is the number how often, of course, the unigram of the first word occurs here. So you see, this is a, a simple division of two uh, occurring numbers of words in the corpus, which can easily be computed. And this, of course, makes life much, much, much more easier. So what we are doing with exactly trying out to come up with the probability that a sentence occurs, first thing what we do is we are applying the Markov assumption 
only require, uh, requiring not the entire history, but only looking at a few preceding words. And then we can decide whether we want to go for one word, two word, three word, considering an n-gram model here. And then calculating the according probabilities that we need, we are using the maximum likelihood estimation and then simply go, we count the occurrence of these n-grams in a word. And of course, by that we can re really easily come or simply come to the probability that we are looking for. So this is our language model. And there we go. And you will see in the next section of the lecture how we really compute exactly these kind of probabilities on a simple example. But before we come to that, I want to show you uh, another example how we can use exactly these kind of engrams. We can use these engrams and the language model to generate also language. So for example, take into account the Shakespeare corpus. This is a huge corpus of all of the words that Shakespeare has written. So it contains roughly 800,000 something words. And the vocabulary he was using consists of roughly 30,000 different kind of words. And if you take all these words, and if you take a unigram model, simply taking into account the probability of the occurrence of a single word, if you try to create text out of that, you create something which is completely random because you know no sequence of words is considered here. So you come up then with something utterly random from the words of Shakespeare. And there are sentences like, to him swallowed confess here both. So this is not of course a valid sentence and so on. It's already a bit better if you are using bigrams, using bigrams, what you do there, you start with a bigram, which is on the beginning of a sentence. So what you also consider here in your bigram or n-gram counts, you consider starting a sentence with a start symbol and ending a sentence with an end symbol. And then you can also manifest exactly what is the beginning and the end of a sentence here. And then you take bigram after bigram which fits and overlaps then by one word here and um, you can simply then go on until you create an entire sentence however it doesn't have to be a valid sentence for bigrams then what comes out of it so you have things like for example why dost stand forth thy canopy forsooth he is this palpable hit the king henry doesn't make sense anymore but it's getting better if you are using trigrams because then you have already a two word overlap. And with four grams, this almost looks like Shakespeare. So you see here with four grams, we have a three word overlap. If we create sentences, then randomly there, we create things like King Henry, what I will go seek the traitor Gloucester, ex eunt sum of the watch, a great banquet served in. I cannot be but so. This sounds like say Shakespeare, doesn't it? So how does it work to generate plausible text from n-grams? I show you this on the example of two grams. For n-grams, you simply have to adapt the algorithm. So you choose from your corpus first a random two gram, which starts with a sentence start. This is here in these uh, angle brackets. You see here um, in these pointed brackets, you see here an S. This is the sentence start. And then you have W1. This is the worst, worst, uh, first word and you choose this somehow by random. Next one, you choose by random another n-gram or in, in this sense a two-gram, which starts with your previous first word, w sub one, and a random second word. But this bigram, of course, must be from your corpus. And then you continue, which means you choose then another word consisting of w sub i, w sub i plus one, until you choose then at some point the last word of a sentence so that you find WN and then an end identifier, which is then here in these angle brackets, you see here um, a slash at S as the last word. And then you put together all of them that you have created and you have a new sentence. Why does this work? Yeah, so. The Shakespeare corpus, as I told you, consists of roughly 800,000 something tokens. Vocabulary size is almost 30,000. And however, if we look at all of the bigrams that Shakespeare really created, we will count roughly 300,000 different bigram types in the corpus. However, taking all potential 
bigrams into a count of these large number of tokens, we will count roughly um, 844 million possible bigram types. So this means we have only um, yeah, used a small fraction of all of the bigrams. So 99.96% of all of the possible bigrams were never used by Shakespeare. He only used 300,000. And if I use four grams, then this fraction that has actually used by Shakespeare is even smaller. That means you only look at such a small fraction of, you know, potential possible, let's say four grams, that the output looks like Shakespeare because it is already fragments of Shakespeare. So therefore, this, uh, this method really works. So this is something what Shakespeare really has written. Of course, it's somehow um, uh, words are in, in different order or sentences are in different order and there is a degree of random in it, but it has been written by Shakespeare. So therefore it is so close. Okay, so this was an example how you can use an n-gram model for the generation of a language. And then in the next part of the language, we will further refine the n-gram model. And we will then also finally talk or give you some examples and what you do, for example, also with words that might occur and then are not in your corpus or bigrams, trigrams that don't occur in your corpus. What do you do there? Because then it's difficult to estimate the probability. If they don't occur in your corpus, the probability would be zero if you count them and you can't count them. So what to do? Learn more about that in the next part of the lecture.